All right. So recording has started. So welcome to our September call of the data facing track, everyone. Uh, today's topic is an institution wide examination of data needs. Uh, the NSF Epoch deep dive at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, a couple announcements real quick. Uh, one is that um, we now have an official email for the coordinators of all the tracks. Um, so for example, if you need to reach me and Galen, that is df-coordinators at carc.org now. And those should all be on the website by now. Um, actually, that's really the only announcement I have today. Cool. All right, so let's get started. Our presenters today, we have Dr. Jen Shaw, who is um, the Director of International Networks over at Indiana U University, and also the Director of Engagement and Performance Operations Center. Uh, so the Engagement and Performance Operations Center is what we'll be focusing on today. It's an NSF funded program to just kind of help universities examine like their institutional data needs um, and help them come up with plans to address those. So um, we are going to be talking about a recent dive they did over at University of Cincinnati. And here to talk about that is Jane Combs. She is the Associate Director of the University of Cincinnati's Research Computing Services Division. And she's also Interim Director of UC's Emerging HPC Center, uh, the UC Advanced Research Computing Facility. Uh, in her role at UC, Jane has worked in a partnership with faculty, departments, and colleagues, UC Libraries, Office of Research, IT at UC, regional universities, regional CI providers, and national resources, such as XSEED, XCRI, to identify, propose, fund, and develop the advanced cyber infrastructure tools required to support UC's research and education missions. So these collaborative efforts have resulted in over 2 million in external funding uh, from NSF, CC, and MRI awards and international institutional support necessary to operate the HPC Center as a core research facility starting in July 2021. So uh, University of Cincinnati has uh, very much an emerging program in uh, research computing. Uh, so they are just building. And with that, I will let Jen and Jane take it over. Great. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate the invitation to talk about this work um, that was actually done last April, um, mm -hmm. April of 19, back when things were normal. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to walk through the EPIC deep dive process, which is based on the ESNet uh, facilities uh, requirements gathering process. Jane's going to talk about the specific, what we did in Cincinnati, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the general findings that we've uh, um, we've experienced in the last few years, Epic is about two-ish years into a four-year project. We've done, I think we've got publications now for six or seven of them, but we've done some others as well that, that aren't, uh, didn't get full reports, but we'll walk through that. So let me share my screen. I'm also going to apologize ahead of time. Like everyone else, I am working from home. I have dogs. Well, mm -hmm. I have family, but I have dogs and the dogs occasionally like to howl at sirens. We have learned if we try to stop them, they howl for longer, so we no longer try that. Um, but, right, everyone can see this all right? Not, not, not great. All right, so, come on. Um, too many. So, we started the Engagement and Performance Operations Center um, formally as part of the CC STAR program a few years ago, um, joint between Indiana University and ESNet. So Jason Zorowski, who's on this call, is my co-PI. Um, 
But we had been doing this informally for quite a while before this. Um, when, when I came on, Deb was asking me about my background in international networks. So I'm a cyber infrastructure guy by training, but I've been working in networks for quite a while, including when I was at the National Science Foundation. And when I got to Indiana University, Jason and I realized there was this real need to do what he had been doing at ESNet, but for non-ESNet programs. Um, all of today's science is collaborative science. You've got multiple partners, multiple data sets, different points of coordination. Um, when we have better access to, to data, when researchers can access more data, they can ask harder questions and do more science, right? So everything we're doing is how do we help the researchers and the scientists do more science? And, and I use research and science interchangeably. Um, education is also lumped in there. So, so just because I'm using one term or another, I, I don't mean it to be exclusive. I mean it to be inclusive. Um, we look at the network as the instrument. This is a slide from Greg Bell at ESNet, um, who saw the connectivity as the first step, but the usability had to follow in the same way as, you know, 20 years ago, using large HPC resources was really, really hard. And it's still difficult now, but it's more straightforward. The usability has to follow on here. So it's not enough to put a network in place. It's not enough to have an end-to-end -end connection. We really need to understand the services and how the pieces fit together. So we set up this engagement and performance operations center with a grant from NSF, um, but we work with anybody. You don't have to be a partner. You don't have to have any connection to NSF. You don't even have to be NSF funded. We have five main focus areas. I'm going to talk briefly about our roadside assistance and consulting and in more detail about the application deep dives, but we also do network analysis, measurement and monitoring. We have this concept of services in a box or managed services. We do training. Um, on the website, you can get a lot more information about that. There'll be some links at the end of the talk as well. So I'd like to start with the roadside assistance process because this was kind of the core idea that the others grew out of. Um, when I began my career, um, for uh, seven years, I was part of the Globus team. And we used to have a lot of, of grid FTP transfers that would work one day and not work the next day. So, you know, my file transfer was doing great last week, but it doesn't work anymore. That was 20 years ago. This still happens today. So we call this roadside assistance because it's like, you know, when you're driving, I, uh, about a year ago, I drove to St. Louis um, and it had car problems part way back. I didn't even know what state I was in. I was pretty sure it was either Illinois or Indiana, but I wasn't sure. You call AAA. You know, you don't need to know where you are or a garage nearby. You have a generic number that you call. They set you up with what you need to go forward. Epic does the same thing here. You know, I don't know why my file transfer is not working. It's just not working. So we work with the end institutions and everything in between to try to figure out why that's going on. Roadside assistance was the core, but one of the things we realized is we also needed a lighter weight consulting process. We get asked a lot of questions uh, about, you know, how should I set up my DMZ or my DTN? In fact, uh, part of the team who's on here now just hopped off a call from another team who was asking us for some advice on setting up a DMZ for some large scale transfers they're planning. Um, we do this kind of uh, one-off consulting all the time. We're trying to get the FAQs together, posting them on fasterdata.es.net. But all you need to do is send mail to epic at iu.edu. Somebody will respond to your mail, loop you in. If we need to do something big like a roadside assistance, we'll see. Sometimes these problems turn up additional issues, either at an institution or with a science group. When that happens, we move forward and often do a deep dive. Sometimes the university will connect will contact us directly. But the same way as roadside assistance is, something immediately has gone wrong, can you help me today? Deep dives are more like tune-ups or regular maintenance, or you're planning to buy a new car, right? So this is the longer term, how can I plan ahead? You know, or, you know, I've been doing the same pattern of behavior for the last five or six years, I'm not sure if it's working anymore. We based our process off of the really successful ESNet facility requirements reviews. Um, they do a couple of these every year for the DOE science facilities. In a way, they've got it easier because they've got a lot more control on what's going on. Everyone 
uh, at a facility will know who the end users are and what's happening. One of the things we've discovered is often the IT people at an institution won't know who the scientists or researchers are, perhaps. The CIO's office may or may not talk to the VPR's office. So part of what we do is we walk through the science workflow with the actual scientist or researcher so that we can understand needs and planning. Um, we were joking earlier when we got on the call that if, if all of the uh, issues were technical, things would be easy. Often the problems we find have nothing to do with networks or technology and a lot to do with sociology and talking to folks. So we have a process. We have a formally defined process for how to do these. Um, we use written case studies, which are basically structured conversations that all of the application end users and the IT folks fill out to talk about where they are and what their needs are. And I'll walk through that in detail. Um, we do these case studies to identify collaborators, instruments and facilities, process of science. We then get together as a group and talk about what has worked and what isn't working now that we've got this these case studies and are on the same, so to speak. And often new issues will come out of that or we'll have a meeting of the minds or we'll explore new problems. After the one-on-one, -on -one, we identify action items and write up a report. In fact, here's my version of the University of Cincinnati Deep Dive Report. It's about 75 pages. Luckily, it has a short executive summary in the beginning and a really nice summary of action items as well. So these case studies, there really are a structured conversation. It's, it, these are the pieces that we need to talk about in order to understand the science and the cyber infrastructure. And we start them because we're talking to researchers in the researcher's happy place, which is talking to them about their science and their research. We want to find out how their research fits into the larger picture of research. Why does it matter to anyone except their group? How, what are they doing and why is it important to them? We then talk to them about the other groups that they're working with. And what is the instrumentation? So what are the resources and facilities they're using, either locally or remotely? And then the piece that I personally enjoy the most is, is, is the process of science. You know, we talk about this a day in the life of a science group, or how do you get from idea to research publication? Because keep in mind, that's, some, that's the monetary unit of a researcher. How many publications did I get out this year? So anything that helps them speed up that end-to-end um, that -end process, this is good for them. If you're lucky, they will, as part of describing that process, tie in the instruments, the people, the resources, and the background. So you'll get a whole story. Sometimes this needs prompting. Then we can, once we have that laid out, get into some more details about some of the technical aspects that we may not have had an opportunity to previously. What's your software infrastructure? Did you build it yourself? Is it open source? Is it commercial? How, how is it maintained? Where is it constructed? What is your network and data architecture that you use? They may not know, or they may know bits and pieces of it. Often we have to have conversations with other people at the university to fill that in. We break out cloud services separately because they have so many pros and cons and people view them so differently. Um, and then we try to ask just a general, you know, what are your outstanding issues and what are your pain points? Often that will bring up other things that maybe could have gotten mentioned earlier, but weren't when they think about it from that point of view. The IT staff are critical to understanding all of these pieces fitting together. So what we do is then we have this face-to-face -face discussion. You're asking, okay, well, we're in the time of COVID. How does this work in a virtual space? And the answer is we haven't figured it out yet. Um, in fact, our advisory committee said, you know, this is complicated enough and the people who have experienced it the energy in the room is so important to this process that we're still trying to weigh um, uh, new approaches. So we bring together all of the scientists who have written those case studies, the IT staff who've written the section on what the campus and, and local infrastructure looks like, and the research administration team as much as we can to talk and to get a shared vision of where things are and how do we go forward to share this information about what the science needs are and how they're growing, plus what the IT needs are and how they're growing in order to kind of get everybody headed in the right direction. Um, the fascinating things, or one of the fascinating things is often these folks may not have ever met before face-to-face -face or virtually. Um, 
it, it really is um, challenging at times to, because you've also got two different languages going on. Um, Jason and I both have spent a lot of time as translators, um, translating science speak into IT speak and vice versa, because what one will ask can get interpreted very differently by the other. Through these um, conversations, we identify the network and other related issues and try to come up with steps forward for either existing problems or anticipated problems. So expected outputs, you know, I've, I've kind of emphasized these pieces already, you know, identify bottlenecks and gaps, figure out how do we move forward, where do we need to invest to help the end-to-end -end system and these end-to-end -end use cases, figure out what person relationships are needed in order to have a functional approach going forward. Um, we then write up a final report. It includes all of the case studies, often with added details from the face-to-face -face conversations. It includes a snapshot of the current science and cyber infrastructure. Um, we write up the discussion notes. In the case of Cincinnati, the discussion notes were about 10 or 12 pages, it looks like. I printed them out separately. Um, and this is written for a general audience. So if someone else picks this up, they should have a general sense of what's going on. It's not written for a specialist. Examples of these final reports are online at epic.global slash materials. About three quarters down the page, you'll see the list of the ones we've published so far. So now I'm gonna hand this over to Jane, who will walk through what we did in Cincinnati. You're muted, Jane. Somebody had to be muted in this uh, in this particular day, didn't they? There we go. And now that I unmuted, I also have dogs, uh, Jennifer, so hopefully my dogs won't trigger your dogs. But um, thanks for uh, explaining the details of, of your process. And um, like I said in the uh, email address or email that went out to this CART group that, you know, we were very fortunate to, I feel, to get in, a, to get a slot on the EPIC team's uh, schedule back in April of 26 of 2019. Um, it was perfect timing for us. Uh, we were, we had some funding that was getting ready to expire in part of a use it or lose it. Um, so so uh, the team was really helpful in getting, pushing us through the process quickly um, uh, and getting the out outcomes. And that's what I'll talk to you about today. Um, so a little bit about the process that we used to collect the data from the researchers before the visit, um, the two-day visit, and then the outcomes and challenges and opportunities for what, uh, for implementation. So the pre-process that we used to identify the use cases that represent ongoing challenges that you see, um, University of Cincinnati is a very large institution. We are a research level one institution. Um, we have a college of medicine. We have a, um, engineering school, but we also have um, a lot of humanities. We have a, a world-renowned uh, Cincinnati Conservatory of Medicine, and we also have DAP, which is our design, art, architecture, and planning. So we have focused on not only the hard sciences and um, the engineering and medicine, uh, we wanted to make sure that we had somebody representing the social sciences as part of our uh, our discovery. <clears throat> so we looked to see who had, uh, who was, first of all, um, friendly partners with us. We knew they had needs. We knew that they had needs uh, that we weren't able to address. Um, so we had high energy physics. We had our Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Me Mechanics, which you can see there. We had three different groups that actually came from there. We had our human genetics and genomics team from our public health group and environmental health, our um, University of Cincinnati Corrections Institute, and that is a uh, from our criminal justice, and they represented our um, kind of our scholarship in digital humanities and then division of statistics and data science. So you can imagine these probably uh, are representative from most universities, maybe not the Corrections Institute, but that was uh, who, who we invited and who ended up coming. Um, on day one, <clears throat> so 
we planned how this worked was a few months before the EPIC team was scheduled to come. We identified those groups that we wanted to work with. And I think there ended up being maybe eight researchers who, who we invited and probably six actually filled out the use case. Um, we had a brief pre-meeting with the EPIC team and the researcher and the IT people, uh, just a virtual uh, phone call to talk to them about what the expectations would be. We um, shared with them the document, the EPIC guys kind of walked through it with them uh, and, and answered any questions. Then we followed up with them after uh, reminding them two or three times to uh, fill it out. It's quite a lengthy document. Um, so, and then what I found the best thing was, is I called them, I set up a time to just walk through their science with them and a couple of them, I actually did the documenting. So that's one of the little tips and tricks that you may have to do, depending on how, it's just, it's just time consuming, but it's perfect. Um, so we had all those ready. They said they're coming on that date and I'm usually always looking for getting a little bit extra out of whoever comes to visit us because we need a lot of help. So I said, well, if you guys are coming in the night before, why don't you come in uh, the afternoon? And, and I don't know if they do this with all the other groups, but um, they, it was so important to our team because our technology group is in IT. We, they, we share the network people. We share the storage people. So they really, this is not their full-time job to be looking at this sort of, um, their tech, this technology. I mean, they've, they've become much more familiar with it, but as a central IT department, uh, particularly in the networking and in storage, they just um, needed some help understanding what the potential could be and what we had there. So we sat with Jason and, um, I don't know if Jason was the only one there, maybe Hans too. And we brought the distributed IT from campus and our IT. The other thing is, you know, I really feel like our IT need, people needed to have the opportunity to hear what is happening now. So we drew that all out. The network engineers at UC drew that out. And then what could be happening. And that was really important because one thing, you know, as IT people, we want to, to, not look completely unaware when we go in front of our customers, our researchers and, and um, other, other administrators. So that was really helpful. And I think that just sitting down with them, the hands on, the talking, the relationship that they created uh, was very important. Um, so that was, that was a little bonus for us. Um, here, it's a horrible picture, but I think you could probably see this is Jason's drawing up here of what what we could be, what we couldn't be, um, and what we should be. So that, um, like I said, we have this this particular thing we made into a chart, which I didn't have with me, but or we made into a slide and drew it. But this has kind of become our little Bible for what we're doing uh, at UC. So who was there on the, on the day two visit? This was the big day where they did the actual um, discussions with the researchers. It was the EPIC team, it was my team, it was our enterprise uh, cyber infra infrastructure and network operations technicians, Office of Research Leadership. It was not our vice president for research, but was one of the AVPs who was at the time uh, in charge of developing infrastructure for researchers and support. Um, the UC researchers, of course, UC libraries, research and data services team who we partner with all the time. Uh, distributed research IT staff, like I said, we had IT staff from the College of Engineering, College of Medicine, um, uh, and the Criminal Justice Department. IU, uh, we're close to IU physically and we are close to them. Uh, partnerships, they help us out a lot. So their chief HPC systems architect who has been helping us develop our HPC systems uh, was there, the College of Medicine, Biomedical Informatics, and also ORNET leadership and technical support. ORNET is Ohio's uh, regional network. So they were there as well, which was great. So you can see it was a big team, a big group. I have the picture here where we're all sitting for a day. Um, we had, 
I've sent out an agenda. This is one of the things that, you know, that, that I think from a university point of view, I sent an agenda. We, we had breakfast. We had very clear expectations as we were going through it. Um, Jason and Hans moderated it. You can't tell from this picture, but it was very interactive. Uh, I don't think that anybody felt uncomfortable. Everybody was very uh, participative. It was so educational for everybody in that room to hear everything. Um, so I, I can't stress enough uh, how to try to make sure that all the stakeholders are there because then everybody hears, first of all, the great research that is happening, but also um, can really understand how important it is to each other and to the community. So the emerging themes to be addressed, um, I will go back and say too that uh, Jason Zorowski originally offered uh, EPIC because we were talking about the money that we had and how we had a science DMZ that needed to be re-looked at um, from our original implementation um, when we didn't know as much about what our needs were as what we do now and it's changing. So we assume that the network was going to be the topic of discussion. What really happened, and this is one of the great things about the EPIC process, was it came out that really the lack of local compute and storage resources were our uh, really floated to the top. I mean, obviously it's a you know fully featured science DMZ infrastructure um, would help it, but without knowing the whole picture of our researchers' needs from beginning to end, we may have just defined a science DMZ that didn't meet the needs. Also, we really realized that our money that we had, we should prioritize it and look at the compute and storage first and then make sure that our science DMZ would meet those needs. Um, so that was one of the one of the really the biggest outcomes for us is that you might think that you know what you need to do, but until you really talk to a representative group and you have experts like Jason and Hans who can get that information from that group and see the bigger picture. Um, we also had a need to identify with, because we didn't have a lot, we don't have very many resources and we're developing them to collaborate with regional national providers and then secure sensitive data and supporting collaborations. So that was the overarching goal they that you know as jen said we got a list of i think 12 action items perhaps um and so what's the outcome of those action items and and our um our experience well we were able to update our cyber infrastructure plan for 2019 <clears throat> to 2024 and have uh with the group uh, including the Office of Research, who funds the majority of our uh, and supports us, and IT, who also supports us. Uh, and everybody agreed because we were all there and we all heard and we got this uh, report that says what we should be doing. So that was great. Um, you know, we included that report in grants to get uh, additional cyber infrastructure. So now we have a report from Epic uh, that has done the all the homework for us or with us. And we also used that report, presented it to the VPR, and now we have funding uh, to subsidize an HPC center. Um, we were able to then prioritize the next development or the development of resources with that information. Um, it helped us continue to create a community of computational sciences and researchers and you know, when you sit next to somebody for three hours, which I, I have to agree, Jen, with the, um, the in-person, but I hate for the world to not, you know, to stop because of that. But really, the, you know, people moved around in their chairs, they sat next to us. So this IT guy was sitting next to that researcher that they had never talked to before, but now they talk to all the time. There were a couple of collaborations that came out of this with our College of Medicine and our data scientists. So, um, that's really a key that's been a key to our team all along. Um, train the trainer, we've continued. Now we've not done as good of a job as what Jason and um, Hans have done, but we, we took your process and we went and we have a new digital features initiative. We sat down with those same pe with those people 
a group of six that represented the group and we came up with the same process or we followed your process and came up with what their needs were. So that was really key. Um, some lessons learned, um, you know, upfront communicate clear expectations of participation for everybody. Um, you know, the filling out the case study, actually our distributed IT helped some people too. You know, it's not, it's really not a thing where you can send it to them and they're just gonna fill it out and send it back, most likely. Um, find those who can directly benefit from the outcomes, um, provide some incentive. Uh, we had our vice president for research sent out a note saying he supported our process and that was really important. And I gave everybody a gift card afterwards for Starbucks. They didn't know that, but it helps. Um, give $10, so it's under the, under the limit. Give researchers enough time to fill out the case study. Uh, it took us at least two months to get that filled out. And we kind of had to, I mean, that, that was pretty short, but it was because of our our timeline that we wanted to get it done. Uh, again, make sure everybody can attend the entire deep dive session so they can learn from each other. Um, you know, researchers like to hear about research and um, they really, it was, uh, it was very interesting to watch, watch them. I will say the, the criminal justice research that they were doing, uh, I think the, the hard scientists were very interested in what they were doing and they had a lot more commonality around data than what they thought they would. Um, and have a plan for afterwards, have an action plan. How are you gonna do it? What are you gonna do with the outcomes? Um, we were, we thought we were gonna buy something with the outcome and then it turned out that we are, you know, we basically set up a five year strategic plan and we're going along the steps. So, um, you know, make sure that you, do something with it. Don't get this report and then be like, well, that was nice of them to come and that was fun. You know, this is really important uh, for university and for emerging centers. Um, and I'm the code track coordinator or co-coordinator of the track for the emerging centers. Um, we're going to try to get on this schedule for them too, because I, I think uh, this was really invaluable having this, uh, having this study done. So that's it for me. Okay, so I'm going to talk about some more general outcomes, um, kind of building off of what Jane has talked about for Cincinnati. Um, you know, right at the end there, um, she said, uh, I'm going to quote you poorly, but you know, the researchers don't know all of the IT details, they're not really concerned about it. You know, the researchers just want things to work. Um, most of the problems we've run across in these, they, they really aren't technical. They're not network related. While this is funded through a networking program, it really is cyber infrastructure end to end. Um, you often don't have contact points across campus systems, so people meet each other at this. There's a lack of understanding of, of how the network or the resources are being used. There's, and from the researcher side, there's a lack of understanding about what resources are even available. Um, so there's tons of stuff going on on your campus as an IT person that you're not going to know about. Um, but one of the other things to keep in mind, and Jane hinted at this, is the solution that, that you, the IT person or cyber infrastructure person, may have in mind may not be the right one for that researcher. And I think we see that time and again. So as Jane said, they thought they were going to do a DMZ and that was the highest priority. But after talking to these end users, their focus shifted some. Um, you know, and I think part of that is, you know, it's this requirements gathering. And there's a lot of different ways to do requirements gathering. We do it through this, this case study. Um, you can get that on the materials list as well. It's about four pages long. It does have the different sections to it. Sometimes it is easier to fill out as a conversation with someone. Um, but at least having somebody approach it and figuring out, you know, how do we talk about our science and, and what are their concerns is I think really important. Cincinnati found out one of their big problems with storage. This is Hands down, the biggest problem that we are hearing across the board from either deep dives, consultations, roadside assistance, nobody has enough storage. If they have storage, it's not easy to use. It's not the right speed or the right type or in the right place. You know, if, even if you've got some of that right, the reliability and the backups aren't right. Um, uh, Jason refers to use the cloud as burning the ships, um, but you can joke about it. In reality, the cloud is often not the right solution for data storage. 
it, it can be slow. There is no way to predict how long something takes to transfer into it or out of it, except you will not exceed the speed that you've been quoted. Absolutely will not. Um, there are often hidden costs. There are, you know, and you know, I refer to the cloud as it's just somebody else's computer. Mm. So you're not really solving a problem. You're shifting it somewhere else and throwing money at it to make it better. Um, there are actually a couple talks at Perk that came out uh, with return on investment that said, you know, we don't see a monetary uh, reduction by using the cloud, quite the opposite. We, you know, when you talk about cloud and data storage, you also have this uh, split between campus versus local. And by local, I mean either within a department or within a, a group within the department. Um, when you have storage compute network resources managed centrally, it's often best supported, it's often more reliable. However, it can often be much harder for the researcher to use. So people default to having their own thing in their own space, right? So you have to try to figure out how do you leverage that and how do you move away from, you know, a researcher thinking, but I have to do this. And maybe they're doing, you know, they're, they're building their own cluster or, or putting in place their own storage because they just don't know what's on the campus or they don't know what's in the region or, or nationally. Um, so it, it can be really challenging and simply telling them, but that's not secure isn't gonna be sufficient. Um, when I lived in the UK, I had a, a lovely experience of people were setting up condor clusters at the time. The biggest condor cluster that we interacted with had a beautiful security policy and it was really absolutely fantastic. In order to run your code, you had to get signed off by one admin. Beautiful cluster. No one used it. Not a single application. It was very secure though. Um, so um, these aren't in any particular order. Put in uh, workflow automation. So a lot of science, a lot of research projects started before there was as much IT infrastructure and as much data and whatever as, as there is now. Um, I worked with the Woods Oceanographic and when they were told to um, make all of their uh, data online, a guy handed me a shoebox. So I have one of these shoe boxes for every cruise I've been on and it was filled up with note cards. He's like, put this online. I'm like, okay, well, A, that's not my job. Um, B, we've got a longer conversation to have here. Um, but if you can automate some of this process, you can do more science. So researchers are into that. However, making a small change on your process may actually screw you up even more. So just as Jane said that the campus needed to take an end-to-end -end view on how to upgrade things, often researchers need to talk to someone to understand their whole end-to-end -end path and which changes they can make in a sensible way and which changes won't put them in a worse spot or a better spot for a little while, but a worse spot longer on. Um, again, often we can offer a solution that may or may not be feasible. We worked with some astronomers in Hawaii that were using wget for huge files. And our first instinct was, oh God, use some other protocol, use some other data gathering thing. That is a horrible choice. They couldn't do it. It was built into all of their scripting, all of everything. So we had to come up with a secondary solution. So, and they got better in performance, as good as they could, maybe not, but we also planted seeds so that they could figure out how they could transition that over time. Um, network capacity, more is not always better. Um, I think in the networking space, uh, we, we have a, a lot of fear of missing out. A lot of people who have proposed, um, we, we actually just talked to someone out uh, late last week. No, you do not need a hundred gig DTN um, there. No one's going to use it. You don't have that kind of capacity. You don't have that kind of need. No application is pushing a hundred gig at this point. You know, people say, oh, I've got, I need 100 gig to the desktop. Let's, let's really think about what that means um, and how much money you're spending on that versus something else. Um, computation is, of course, one of these focal points, um, but often the data movement is harder than the computation, especially for the people of campus champions. That said, not everybody has campus champions. Um, people will use whatever hardware infrastructure they're aware of they're often not aware of what their options are. 
we've actually seen a lot of really good approaches with regional sharing. Um, uh, I don't actually know how to pronounce Circa, um, but that's the Sunshine State uh, Regional Alliance. That's, really, that's a really nice example of that. Um, the Eastern Regional Network is doing something similar. Um, so there's also some interesting inflection points of buying versus running versus renting versus other things and, and you know, using NSF resources versus using local resources that you need to take into consideration uh, because moving once you've picked a platform can be really challenging. Um, there's another group that step one to use their infrastructure to work with them. You need to, to migrate your entire science to a GPU with a special interface and a special enclosure and all of this. Often that's just not feasible for most researchers unless someone else is paying for it. We spend a lot of time talking about usability um, and seeing people who are lacking usability. Um, how you design and operate things, you really should try to get as broad a perspective as you can um, because which of these things are you doing to make your life easier as a cyber infrastructure guy or someone who's maintaining versus the person who's using for it? Um, that really needs to get taken account from day one. You will set things up differently if you think about that side of it when you think about the other side of it. Um, assistance is needed and hard. Understanding what researchers are saying versus what you're hearing can be really challenging. Um, most research teams need help. They don't know how to use the technology. They just want things to work. You know, we were joking when the call started. Um, you know, I travel internationally a ton normally. Normally I'm on the road about a third of the time, um, of which about half or more of that's international. I show up in a new country, I get a text message, my phone just magically works. I have no idea how this happens. That's the expectation of how people interact with technology now. It's not what it was like 20 years ago where you had to understand great gory details and how all these pieces worked. They just want to be able to do their stuff. They want knowledgeable advice on how to do these things. You know, your solution may or may not be the answer. They want to understand how do I get to where I'm trying to get to? How do I get my science done? Um, and it's, it's challenging. You know, we, we've all had those end users who don't listen to you, who won't try new things, who won't move places. It's an ongoing conversation. So I think that's one of the things that Jane mentioned that I'd really like to emphasize that we hear this all the time. You know, the deep dives are a starting point. We offer a list of action items to start to move forward on. You know, how that continues is extremely important and how you move forward. Um, I always love these pictures of, you know, here's your design and here's your user experience. Every campus has these. Except for one campus, I was told, when they first put in a new building, they didn't put in any sidewalks. They waited to figure out where the deer paths were. And that's where they decided to put the sidewalks in. I think that's really sensible. So um, building these relationships is a piece that comes out of almost every one of these deep dives as well. We're always fascinated to see which groups knew of which other groups or how they're interacting. Um, sometimes even the scientists come up with new collaborations as part of this, but bridging the gap between the cyber infrastructure and the research technology is really needed. Um, Jane commented that, you know, this was out of scope for the IT folks she's used to dealing with. It's out of scope for most groups. IU is a weird place where we have an entire research technology division that, that works in this space, um, as opposed to just doing enterprise. Most of the places we work with, though, are small, medium size, um, and they don't have dedicated people looking at what do researchers need. They're trying to make sure the wireless is up, the network is up, the email is running, you know, Canvas is running, you know, today Zoom is running. Um, they're not used to thinking about how does a chemist move a really large data set from that instrument that you didn't even know they bought to the data store that they're not supposed to be using that way and then onto their collaborator in another state? So it's challenging, we get that. But figuring out how to do this is, is what we need to help the research in science. And that's why we're in this job, right? We're not here to just build a huge network or to build the next big thing. We're here to help researchers 
and scientists, you know. So um, this is actually a slide I stole either from Doug or from Jason. You know, your cosmology group probably doesn't care what virtualization is, but they would like to move their data easier. They'd like to do it predictably and they'd like to do it in a way that makes them more productive. So last two slides. Um, everything we're doing here is how do we help researchers do their science easier, faster, more? How can we look at data challenges? How can we move data? How can we figure out how to bridge those conversations and put in place that infrastructure as well, the socio-political infrastructure as much as the technical infrastructure? Um, if you have questions or comments, if you are interested in a deep dive whenever we can travel again, we're trying to figure out how to do these in the time of COVID. Um, the best we can come up with is scale it way the hell down and maybe we'll find a guinea pig when we can all breathe again in another couple months, we're not sure. But if you have a roadside assistance or a consultation problem or just want more information, we have a generic email address, epic at iu.edu. You're welcome to contact any of us from the team. We've got a whole bunch of stuff online at epic.global. If you go to epic.global, there's a materials tab at the top. You can get all of our reports from there, uh, overviews of the different bits and pieces. Um, I also wanted to mention, although it's not on this slide, we do a lot of consulting for the CC STAR program, both before and after award. If you're thinking about putting in a CC STAR proposal, assuming that that program looks, that solicitation looks something like it has in the past, we're happy to talk to you about options going into it. We actually have an entire page that talks about how we'll work with people um, as a letter of collaboration or collaboration post grants. Um, and actually we have a brand new newsletter. I think the third one's gonna go out sometime this week. So you can sign up for that too. Um, and with that, that is my last slide. So at this point, I'm happy to take questions. Unless there might be something in the chat. I wasn't reading the chat because I was talking. I don't know if there's any questions or comments. We haven't seen any questions in the chat yet. Quiet group today. So I'll ask one of Jane. Okay. What would you have liked to have done differently? How, you know, so, so in the follow on, you know, as you've been working on this since we left mm -hmm. and since the report, um, what's gone well with the following one and what hasn't? Um, I would say what's gone well is that we have used it externally, the report, and internally in my department. I, I wish what I would have had planned more was to take that, the recommendations and go to our office of research and to we have a faculty advisory committee that's been developed since that but if i would have had that faculty advisory committee in place at that point then they could have looked at that and we could have recommended funding internally it took us a cut i guess really just a year and a half to get to that point but i wish i could have um and you know it's it's kind of about timing but um just really had a plan for what I was going to do. I, I really, I, I really underestimated, I think, what we were going to get out of our session. And um, knowing that after the fact, I would have had had a bigger plan. Um, you know, I still, and also to stay in contact. You know, it's hard because it's, it is like you were saying, it, and it's just, it's kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing, uh, which you know is hard for IT enterprise people but it's hard for all of us without enough people to help us go out and talk to all those people. Um, you know, each, each case is different. Uh, so that's the other thing that I'm, I'm still trying to find out is how do you put your researchers in categories that fit, but don't make them to be too vanilla, but allow you to be able to prioritize and to move forward with what, you, what the needs are for, you know, it'll never be the 80% um that that what it says you know well we we want to serve 80 percent of the people with this one solution but um that's yeah. something we're constantly striving for I, I think that can be really challenging um i think um one of the the things that we get a lot is you know well i thought this was going to give me advice on my network and it's like well it's cyber infrastructure because there is no network by itself anymore when you're talking about data movement you know, I, 
wearing one of my other hats, you know, I have these international networks, which are huge, big, you know, we were talking cable circuits over 100 gig circuits over cables under the ocean. They're never the problem, unless the cable's broken, which does happen, very rare, and it takes six weeks to fix. Um, that's never the problem. The problem is, is always, almost always the campus router to the person's machine. Right. And, and, but figuring out where on that path is really challenging or it's a piece of software. So I think that's been, uh, you know, to look at the end to end path, not just the end end science, but the end to end cyber infrastructure, I think is one of the pieces. Look, we got a question, Jane, the list of action items for your team is pretty daunting. There were nine of them in this report. Um, yep. Which is seems to be the most challenging to implement? Well, I, it's funny because I was just going to say the one thing that that um, Jason and Hans and and Jen did point out that it's not enough to do the action items, purchase things. This we needed more staff, and we needed the people, and that that by far has been the hardest thing for me to implement is to get positions funded. Um, in, in a sustainable way to facilitate these kind of conversations, to architect this kind of hardware, and then to run and make it happen. So that's, uh, that's definitely been the hardest for us. Yeah, I think part of what we've been trying to do is, is to show the return on investment. Mm -hmm. and invest in your IT infrastructure a little bit look at how much more you'll get out of this. I think that's, that's an ongoing problem we've all seen. And you have to have the people to do it. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Deb? All right, well, thank you very much for your presentation today. Uh, we will see you all next month. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.